Thank you very much. And I am really very happy and honored to share this special occasion of Michal's birthday. And uh, I'm also sorry that for this occasion I took such a dark subject <laughs> to talk about. Uh, it's, it's, in a sense, quite paradoxical because outside it's a very beautiful day and, and I will try to uh, share with you, actually, my frustration connected with the problem of dark matter in cosmology. Uh, well, uh, I, will, I will first concentrate on some observational data. Uh, starting from the standard uh, stuff connected with rotational curves of galaxies and then later go to something more uh, recent. Then I will uh, try to describe very briefly uh, results of a uh, lot of searches for dark matter particles and then say a few words about models where people are trying to uh, propose ways of uh, um, um, connecting the observations with, with some uh, modified gravity which does not require existence of dark, of dark matter particles. You see, the classical uh, case uh, actually from which almost the, the problem of dark matter started connected with the, uh, well, uh, improved astronomical observations which allowed to follow and measure the rotational velocities of stars in uh, spiral galaxies uh, around the uh, central part. And the measured uh, curve, which is represented here, as you can see, this yellow points represent observations of actual stars moving around the center of the galaxy. But, of course, there is also so-called invisible part where you can still find clouds of neutral hydrogen. And using radio astronomical techniques, it is possible also to find the rotational velocity of uh, hydrogen clouds around the central part of the galaxy. So that's the uh, rotational, velo actually observed rotational velocity of a galaxy. Uh, if you, on the other hand, assume that the whole mass uh, is concentrated in the visible part, that actually stars represent the matter content inside the galaxy, then you expect that the rotational velocity will fall down as required but the simple Kepler's laws. So uh, the best studied example of a rotational curve, sorry that it is not really very visible uh, here, uh, is our Milky Way galaxy. So again, this curve here represents observations. So the dark points are observations of actual stars moving around the uh, uh, center of our galaxy. Our sun is somewhere here. And then the rest uh, was done uh, in radio astronomical observations looking for uh, neutral hydrogen clouds. So this is the observed rotational curve. And now, if you try to reproduce this rotational curve by uh, adding uh, disk and bulge, uh, which is observed in our Milky Way galaxy, then it turns out that th there is a huge difference between observations and uh, expectations of a standard uh, model based on the distribution of visible on uh, on, on matter which emits light. And then in order to fit the observational curve, astronomers decided uh, actually in late, uh, late 1970s to add uh, dark matter halo. So this is a profile of the 
dark matter cloud in which our galaxy is actually immersed. <coughs> and then, when you add everything, you can reproduce this uh, curve. Well, it turns out that there is another reason why the dark matter is actually needed for the existence of galaxies. Because if you ask the question, uh, is this system which you see here dynamically stable, then it turns out that uh, this disk-like distribution of matter on a time scale much shorter than the age of the universe will uh, collapse. So uh, there was a problem. Uh, why galaxies are visible? Why, why they are stable? And it turns out that if you add this additional uh, dark matter halo, this dark matter, matter halo is stabilizing the small part which is inside, which is the uh, disk of a galaxy. Well, uh, nowadays we have a lot of observations connected with the rotational curves. So here is a collection for something like 50 different galaxies. And what's, what's important is that though there are some uh, curves which, which uh, uh, tend to uh, go down, uh, majority has this asymptotic flat uh, region. Uh, and if you look now at this uh, part of the diagram, when you see the rotational velocity as measured in kilometers per second, as you can see, the, uh, the, the flat part is something between uh, 300 and uh, 150. So there is a, not a big spread in the rotational velocities of galaxies. Another uh, reason why in cosmology we really need to include some uh, extra components came from observations of clusters of galaxies. These are large, uh, one can say the largest elements in the universe, uh, connect, containing between uh, 50 and several hundred galaxies. And it turns out that almost every cluster of galaxies we looked at in x-rays contains a very hot gas in the center. This, by uh, observing the uh, amount of energy which is coming from the central part of this uh, hot gas, it is possible actually to uh, measure temperature profile, how the temperature of this gas is changing with the distance from the center of this uh, galaxy. And the temperature of the central part of this uh, gas is, it turns out to be several million degrees. Such a hot gas can survive in the cluster of galaxies only if it is captured in a sufficiently deep gravitational potential well. So from the temperature profile of this gas, it is possible to uh, deduce the gravitational potential well. And from that, one can estimate the mass of the, galaxy, of the cluster of galaxies. And it turns out that if in standard spiral galaxies, there is probably something between five and ten times more dark matter than visible matter in clusters of galaxies. This factor jumps to about between 50 and 200 and even for some clusters of galaxies higher. Well, these are a few examples of uh, profiles of uh, energy uh, distributed in, in x-rays of different clusters. <coughs> and uh, as, I, as I told you already, almost every cluster which was looked at in x-ray radiation has this uh, very uh, hot 
uh, cloud of gas in the central part. Another independent way of measuring the mass, total mass, of a cluster of galaxies is by observing the effect of lensing. So if you have a cluster and a galaxy which is farther away, then the gravitational field produced by the cluster works as a lens, as a gravitational lens, and by observing the images of the galaxy which is farther away, it is possible now with uh, very powerful computers to rep reproduce the uh, map of the mass distribution inside this cluster. And again, uh, it turns out that if you uh, measure mass in this way, completely independent from hot gas or motion of galaxies, as a matter of fact, uh, the, uh, you, you uh, again uh, come to the conclusion that the cluster contains a lot of unseen matter. Well, the last uh, very classic by now example, which you cannot see here very precisely, so maybe I will turn my uh, laptop screen uh, so you can see better. This is so-called Ballet uh, Cluster, when, when two uh, clusters of galaxies uh, well, uh, uh, astronomers say collided, but this is not really the appropriate way because there was no collision. They just, they just passed through each other. And in passing through each other, this, this blue stuff, which you can see here, represents the distribution of dark matter in these clusters. And this uh, uh, pink uh, uh, elements here represent the baryonic gas uh, which is inside the cluster. And here on this, on this screen, you can see, you can see really the, that, that, that the effect of the trapping of the standard matter irrespective of the motion of the clouds of uh, dark matter. Another independent source of information about the matter content in the universe came from the uh, observation of the small fluctuations in the microwave background radiation. So this picture is a very beautiful one. Uh, I'm very proud to show you. This is a, a final results of observation of the European Planck mission, which measured the small fluctuations in the distribution of microwave background radiation. And now, by analyzing the statistical distribution of this temperature fluctuation, you can deduce a power spectrum. So here, on this scale, it's the scale of the size of the perturbation or the multiple moment. And on this side, this is the amplitude of these perturbations. And you can see uh, uh, a wavy uh, type of uh, uh, structure here, which, well, uh, by measuring the uh, peak and the position of the peak of all of these uh, amplitudes, it's possible to deduce basic param pa parameters of a, a cosmological model. And here is a li list of these basic parameters, this TT uh, stands for temperature-temperature correlation. TE and EE stands, that was first done by Planck, uh, temperature and electric type polarization, and also uh, per correlations between uh, polarizations on a different scales. And as you can see, what's important is that uh, if you look at the baryonic, this omega b times small h square stands for uh, 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 
fraction of the baryonic uh, matter uh, with respect to so-called critical density, h small is this Hubble constant divided by 100. And as you can see, it's far away from 1. Omega c times h square is the uh, uh, matter content. Uh, times uh, this uh, uh, Hubble constant. And again, it's smaller than 1. And if you now know that this h is something like 0.7, and you calculate the uh, content, the matter content of the universe, you see that this is drastically different from the, from the baryonic content. So there is roughly about five times more dark matter in the universe than baryonic matter. This fact was deduced assuming that, well, Einstein equations uh, hold, that general relativity hold, that, well, on the galactic scales, Newtonian physics hold. So, uh, this is the famous triangle of Ostreicher and Steinhardt when we have uh, three uh, basic cosmological uh, parameters. Omega k measures the, curv the curvature component of the universe. Omega lambda is this now famous dark energy. And omega m is the matter content of the universe. Now, from, as you can see, the CMB or microwave background radiation observations from the observations of clusters of galaxies and from the observations of supernovae type 1a, uh, uh, the region uh, of the parameter space, which is best fitted by the models, is the so-called lambda CDM uh, model, where, uh, as you can see, omega k is 0, omega lambda is 0.7, and omega m is roughly 0.3. So that's a uh, combined uh, um, split of the uh, standard matter, dark matter, and dark energy uh, as a balance of the energy content in the universe which we lived in. Well, recently, because of the great advances in observational astronomy, astronomers started to look at very peculiar galaxies. These are so-called low surface brightness galaxies or dwarf spheroidal galaxies. These are small objects with mass sizes comparable to the scale of a globular cluster, so up to uh, one million uh, times the mass of the sun. Uh, and, well, again, unfortunately, on the screen, screen you cannot see anything. So let me, let me show you. Uh, uh. So on this side, on this side is a big picture taken, taken by uh, the Keck telescope on Mauna Kea in Hawaii, and on this picture you see enlarged central part, and this central part is a galaxy. This one? Okay. Okay. So, uh, by, by measuring the properties of this galaxy, it turned out that its total mass, total mass is about 10 to the 10 times the mass of the sun, that mass to the light ratio for this galaxy is only around 50. It's only around 50, so much larger than for a typical spiral galaxy. It is surrounded by a cloud of globular clusters, and astronomers almost counted to around 100. And then it turns out that the central part of this galaxy 
is dominated by dark matter. The central part, the one at the radius from which half of the light is coming from this galaxy, is, contains 98% of dark matter. So this is the most dark galaxy known today. Now, you see, I am fortunate to be in the physics department when there are very many different groups. And on the, we, the general relativity is on the fifth floor. This is the highest floor in our new building in, of the University of Warsaw. Uh, elementary particle physicists are a floor down. And of course, this is a large group. So I have a diff many friends in this community, and everybody from this community has its private list of different possible uh, particles which could be a particles of dark matter. Professor Meissner, which was here yesterday, is an advocate of axions. He thinks that axions uh, will play the role, uh, it's possible, of uh, dark matter, but as I will tell you in a few minutes, it's all searches for dark matter particles up to as far as I checked this morning, uh, nobody has seen anything. Okay? So that's the source of frustration. And as you can see, of course, theorists, uh, this, is, this is following the Roger, uh, probably fantasy or maybe fantasy and fashion <laughs> combined, that you see there are different possibilities. There are really a lot of different possibilities. Actually, uh, the most favored ones are, uh, well, uh, axions, because I like Professor Meissner, uh, but that's, that's the only reason why I think that axions uh, are at the top of this list. But being more serious, I think that uh, since, uh, as you know, uh, in the elementary particle physics, uh, people are looking for signs of uh, breakdown in the standard model. And there are different possibilities. Again, if you look at this as a diagram, there are many different uh, possibilities proposed. But one which is really very interesting is a supersymmetry. And, uh, well, in the, in the supersymmetric uh, uh, theory, uh, there should be a, a mirror, in a sense, universe composed of uh, supersymmetric particles. Uh, of course, the lightest stable supersymmetric particle would be a perfect candidate for dark matter. But as I will show you in a moment, uh, all searches for supersymmetric uh, dark matter failed so far. So, uh, uh, just taking this problem at a, at a very general level, one can say that since, well, if you assume that dark matter is contained with particles, then since we have not seen them yet, it means that they, if they exist, they interact very weakly with standard matter. And then, uh, for different cosmological reasons, uh, preferred type of dark matter particles are particles with mass larger than the mass of the proton. These are called weakly interacting massive particles. And if you assume that they are really weakly interacting, and you know from the, from the observed amount of dark matter in the universe, that it really nicely fits with the hypothesis at, that at the very early stages of the evolution of the universe, in, uh, excuse me, rather post-inflationary stage, uh, 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 they were in the thermal uh, equilibrium with the rest of the standard uh, matter particles, and then they decoupled. But they decoupled at the level of 
uh, weakly interacting particles and the uh, a, a kind of a characteristic particle, the weakly interacting particle is neutrino. So if you do that, you, you, can, you can say that these parameters, weak interaction, so this cross-section uh, times the mass, comes perfectly OK with uh, expectations from coming from real, observ real astronomical observations. So how to, how to look for uh, dark matter particles? Of course, they should, though weak, very weakly, interact with standard particles. So there's, there, 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 there are three possible ways of looking for such particles. Uh, uh, indirect detection, direct detection, and production in accelerators. So let me show you uh, first uh, the basic idea of uh, direct uh, searches. You, 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 you take a pure blob of standard matter. And since the dark matter particles are, are so uh, many, uh, actually, OK, I, I grabbed here, uh, of course, a lot of standard uh, baryonic particles. But according to estimates, I have here between 3 and 10 dark matter particles. The problem is to find them. So uh, since they are everywhere, they scatter with standard matter, and, and you, have, you have to design some uh, different techniques to observe the effect. So of course, uh, there are many groups now that try to find the uh, dark matter particles using this uh, uh, simple idea that they scatter with the standard standard matter. So uh, the, on this list, which, which you, you see, there are six. The only experiment which has some positive results is DAMA. It's the experiment which is, provide, which is done in Gran Sasso in Italy, deep underground laboratory. And they see they have a very pure germanium crystals hidden down underground, surrounded by lead, uh, copper, etc., etc., And they see a, a modulation in the uh, uh, signal during the uh, year. Nobody else uh, reproduced this result. So in the elementary physics community, this result is still uh, with a big question mark. Uh, very soon, next year, uh, a, a similar uh, design will be reproduced in Canada, and we will see if they will be able to reproduce the result of DAMA. And then, of course, this will be a very important. Indirect is just that, uh, of course, uh, if there are dark matter particles, there are dark matter particles and antiparticles. And occasionally, they collide, they annihilate, producing some sort of standard uh, particles. And then we look for these particles, mostly high energy neutrinos or high, high energy photons. And also, since then, they can produce electron-positron pairs and even proton-antiproton pairs. There are different uh, now. Uh, groups which are looking for uh, these uh, signs of annihilation of dark matter particles, mostly coming from the central part of our galaxy, where the density of dark matter particles is uh, the largest. So far, as I told you already, uh, the situation is quite frustrating. Because all these efforts to detect uh, dark matter particles as of today failed. So uh, since we have now this fantastic instrument at CERN in Geneva, which can uh, collide two streams of protons, 
uh, with very high energy. It is now reaching the uh, top energy of about 14, G, 14 TeV. So maybe uh, we can find uh, dark matter particles there. The problem is that dark matter particle will not be detected by all the instruments which are around. So you see nowadays, uh, in the first, in the so-called first run of LHC, they were focused on finding the Higgs particle. So they, uh, the, the algorithm for selecting uh, events was designed in such a way that concentrating only exclusively on collisions which could lead to the discovery of Higgs particles. Now they are looking for so-called dark decays. So they know what's the energy of the colliding protons. They sum up the energy of all particles which they, they can uh, detect. And if there is a huge imbalance, this could be a sign of a dark matter particle. So there are many searches now. This green one is with this run one with uh, 8 TV, this uh, yellow one with 13 TV. And nowadays, they can only provide you uh, limits, no real detection, and also no real detection as far as supersymmetric particles are concerned. A week ago, we had a conference in Warsaw, which was called Discrete, and there were many talks also connected with the uh, uh, re uh, experiments leading to the detection of supersymmetric particles at LHC. And the talk was given by Laurie from Milano. And the conclusion was, we haven't found it. <laughs> okay. Now, other recent results come from uh, two experiments which are using xenon as a source uh, as a target for dark matter scattering. But again, they, they give only uh, limits. There is no sign of any detection. But the limit is that uh, you can see the particle possibly can have a mass of around 40 GeV. But no positive result. So uh, coming to the theoretical side, well, first of all, there are some basic uh, observational limits. Uh, uh, if, you, if you add the uh, all matter content, matter content in the universe relative to the uh, critical density is 0.27. The dark energy is 0.73. It adds up to almost exactly 1, so shows that omega k is practically zero, so the geometry of the universe is flat. Now, the only uh, popular theoretical idea how to explain this discrepancy between observations and the existence of matter comes from the uh, so-called um, modified Newtonian dynamics model in which uh, uh, it is postulated that there is a limiting value of acceleration. That to the uh, set of uh, uh, constant in the physical universe, physical world, we have to add another one, uh, acceleration. Limited acceleration, as you can see, if you, if you use standard units meter per second square, it comes to 10 to the minus 10. So it's a very small, very, very tiny. But surprisingly, it shows up at many different uh, observations. Not only it explains the flat 
rotational curve of the galaxy. But also, again, surprisingly, if you uh, recalculate this using universal unit when g is equal to c is equal to h is equal to 1, it turns out that this a0 is approximately equal to h to the, Hubble co to the present value of the Hubble constant and approximately equal to the square root of lambda. Why it is so, it's unclear. <coughs> this a shows up also in another type of observation. It's not only rotational velocity, but if you look at the uh, surface density of uh, spiral galaxies, which you can uh, deduce by observing at the, uh, at the light coming from the uh, disk of the galaxy, again, the central part, the central density in the galaxy is related to this A0. A0 divided by the uh, standard Newtonian gravitational constant. So as you see, the reason why I am so frustrated uh, thinking about the problem of dark matter, because on the one, on the one hand side, uh, if you, again, assume that general relativity is correct and on a galactic scale, Newtonian uh, gravity is a, uh, vibe, is a sensible theory, then from this you deduce that there should be some additional dark matter. But when you start to look at possible candidates of dark matter, and especially when you look at uh, results of experiments, which are trying to search for dark matter particles, as of today, the result is very negative. So we have this uh, state of, of total frustration, total frustration. On this, one can look at two different sides. One can get frustrated and very pessimistic that, well, something, is something we don't understand, something is really very wrong. But on the other hand, especially for the young part of this audience, not, not very many here, uh, it's very optimistic. It's clear that we are approaching a state, uh, I don't want to say revolution, but a state where new ideas are really needed in order to explain and release us from the state of frustration. Let's hope that we don't have to look to wait too long for this to happen. Thank you very much for your attention. <laughs> <laughs> okay, maybe so, maybe solution for this? <laughs> well, you <we> judge. <laughs> um, I just should explain that in the scheme of formal cyclic cosmology, there is a necessary uh, content to the universe which could easily dominate it, which would be a scalar field yeah. which is acts only gravitationally. Yeah. And this comes about from the equations which would govern the crossover yeah. from one eon to the next. Very possibly the dominant uh, contribution to matter in the universe. This would, it's basically a, a partner to, gravi to gravity. Uh, when you're in the previous eon, it doesn't have a real existence. Yeah. It would be simply introduced in order to make the, the formalism conformally invariant. Yeah. But because of the reciprocal hypothesis which you need to introduce, which it sort of switches things around, it becomes a real material. So after the crossover to the new eon, there has to be, just from the equations, there has yeah. to be a scalar material. Yeah. And it would pick up the gravitational degrees of freedom yeah. from the previous eon. Yeah. Now, it's, uh, it doesn't tell you anything about this material, except that it probably dominates the universe, and it would be a scalar, and it would interact only yeah. gravitationally. Yeah. Now, uh, you might ask, what is the mass of the particles for this field? Here is a pure guess. But since it is the, in this theory, the particles of gravity, the guess would be that it's Planck mass particles. 
Now, I, I talked to, without having this idea, talked to uh, Jim Peebles uh, about nine months ago at a yeah. meeting and asked him what the limits were from the astrophysical point of view of the mass <coughs> of the dark matter particle. And he said the limits are absolutely huge. <coughs> they could be small, yeah. could even be as big as the sun, which I don't think he believed, and I didn't believe. Yeah. But nevertheless, Planck mass is, from that point of view, a possibility. Of course, it's not very helpful if you want to see it in an accelerator or something. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, 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 I, I, I absolutely agree, and I'm, I'm really very glad for this comment. You see, when you, when you look at Mont, okay, Mont is in a sense an uh, ad hoc devised, uh, I, it, it's even very difficult to say idea. It's a, it's a kind of a patching something, okay, uh, which is destroying the beauty of Newtonian and, of course, and everything, okay. So, as you can, say, as you can see, I am not an advocate of the, of the Mond theory. But, you see, these are observational facts. And since this is acceleration, I was thinking about, you know, this uh, idea that conformal theory could do the job here. But, but again, it's a ve at a ve very early stage, as you know, of development. But well, this being, it would still yeah. be Einstein, Lander, yeah. Einstein, yeah. Lander, yeah. Yeah. Cosmic yeah. Relativity. Yeah. Um, the Lander is needed, yeah. or dark energy, if yeah. you like to call it that. Yeah. The Lander is needed for the theory, yeah. otherwise you don't have yeah. a, a space-like yeah. uh, <coughs> future infinity. Yeah. So you yeah. need a cosmological yeah. constant. Yeah. But you also need, for yeah. the theory to be consistent, yeah. this dark yeah. component. Yeah. And it doesn't... Yeah. Change the Einstein equations. Yeah. It's just that you have a new, yeah. an additional. Yeah. 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 You see, uh, uh, one reason why uh, this is great. One reason why this is not already, you know, widespread is that there is a huge opposition in the elementary particle physicists. They, 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 they need some idea why the uh, standard model is not complete to find, you know, a, 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 a sign of breakdown. They would love to find a sign of a breakdown of the standard model. And of course, this uh, is, if, if you, if you uh, now look at this uh, conformal idea, it tells you that the elementary particle physicists should look at a different side somewhere, somewhere else. Okay? <laughs> Well, it's interesting that you say that Christoph Mazner yeah. was supporting axions. Yeah. But he uh, ought, if, when he's certainly talking yeah. about CCC, yeah. he yeah. should be taking view that there has to be this scale. Yeah. 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 Extreme just doesn't make sense yeah. without an additional scalar yeah. figure. Yeah. 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 Okay. Yes? I have one comment concerning the spiral galaxies. From my little experience of modeling uh, these objects, I can say that um, the flat rotation curve, uh, this is not uh, a problem uh, because uh, uh, if we uh, want to uh, derive the distribution of mass in the disk group in the genes theory, it is uh, truly possible to do it uh, by some integral transform in this group from flat rotation curve. Uh, the problem, the real problem is, as Professor Bineski said, is that these objects will be unstable. So then maybe the, the another path of uh, this frustrating uh, topic is uh, to search uh, uh, about our understanding of these astrophysical problems. Uh, the formation of structures, maybe the, the dynamics of the galaxy and galaxy clusters. So, so this is a, another path. Just one Sorry. brief comment about this frustration. I think that before we don't discover something, okay, we are frustrated. But uh, I can see two at least examples where we have or had been frustrated. 
And the, the two examples were extrasolar planets. Okay, there was a lot of uh, reasonable evidence that they existed. Okay, so and and finally it was done. Okay, it was discovered. And the same uh, with gravity waves. Okay, also I I remember lots of colleagues who were fully in that. Now they are discovered. So I think for the young, younger generation, simply they have a challenge. And uh, surely there will be some moment, unless, uh, okay, it's scalar field or something else, but if it's, it's rooted in particle physics, sooner or later it will become no, the no, fact. Yes, yes, yes. So, so I would not be so... My, my problem with this frustration is that I don't have a lot of time. <laughs> but for them, it's, it's yes. a future a fantastic yeah. challenge. Yeah. Okay, then thank you very much, and we move on to the next talk.